Hello there, Hazel, and here we are ready for Thursday's recording of The Night Bus Hero. Now, our last chapter ended on um, Hector's dad taking him and giving him quite a severe talking to, wasn't it? And saying that he has to write a letter of apology to Mrs. Vergara, uh, which he's really not keen on doing. Um, his mum, Leonora, has come home and she was talking about what's going on with the statues and the homeless people. But the last person on Hector's mind at the end of that chapter when he went upstairs to his room to play his adventure games was the homeless man. He's really playing on Hector's mind. So let's see what happens now in chapter five, the eyes, uh, chapter six, sorry, the eyes that spied. That night, Dad stood over me while I wrote the letter to Mrs. Vergara. It was only three lines, but they made me want to hurl up my dinner. So, before I left for school the next morning, I threw the note away and put the new one in I had secret, secretly written instead. I was planning to walk the long way round instead of cutting through the park like usual, but just as I got to the park gates, I changed my mind. I wanted to see if the old man was still there on his bench, or if I had actually made him leave for good. I didn't want him or any police that might be there to see me, so I snuck through the trees instead of taking the pathway. As I got closer to the bench, I could see that the old man wasn't there. Neither was the dirty red sleeping bag he usually sat in. In his place were two kids from the upper years at school, holding hands and giggling, and there wasn't a police officer in sight. I had won. I had made the old man so scared of me, and so sad about losing his trolley full of rubbish, that he had left. Will had been right. That bench really was ours now. I whooped out loud and punched the air, scaring the icky kissers so much that they got up and left. I couldn't wait to tell Will and Katie that I had done it. It didn't even matter that it was a little bit by accident. I was truly unstoppable now. Making my way out of the park and onto the big road that led to school, I headed to the sweet shop that stood on the corner. It's the only sweet shop near to school, so it's always super busy. It's called McEwen's Delights, even though Mr and Mrs McEwen are two of the scariest and strictest sweet shop owners in all of history. They only ever let four children into the shop at a time, and Mr McEwen watches the door to stop anyone from sneaking in and making it five. Mrs McEwen treats everyone as if they're a potential criminal, even grown-ups and watches them so closely that sometimes the smaller children run out without even buying anything. Today I felt like celebrating my victory over the old man, so I decided to stop by the sweet shop and see who was outside. As I got closer to the shop, I could see Mr McEwen in the doorway, surrounded by a puddle of bobbing heads, shouting, Oi, there's four in there already. Don't even try it, Missy, or you'll be banned. As I looked around, I saw something bright and luminous yellow flash. It was a police officer and she was kneeling and talking to someone. And that someone was sitting on a dirty red sleeping bag. At that moment, a boy called Jason Slater must have felt me standing behind him because he suddenly turned round and with a small shriek, chucked his sweet packet at me and ran away. His best friend, Diana, looked down at her sweet packet and chucked it at me too, before running off to catch up with him. I think that's because they thought he was probably just going to take them anyway. But I didn't care about the sweets. I kept staring at the police officer's bright yellow back and her round black hat as she nodded and said words that I couldn't hear. I craned my head to see better without getting too close. It was him, the old trolley man. And suddenly he was looking straight at me with his deep brown eyes. Then the police officer had turned round and was looking at me with her bright blue-grey eyes too. I took three small steps back and, when the police officer didn't tell me to stop, I took off, running up the road towards school, checking over my shoulder every few seconds to see if she was behind me, but she wasn't. Hey, what's up with you? asked Will as I crashed into him outside the front gates. I was too out of breath to even speak. 
I wanted to tell him that the old man wasn't in the park anymore, but was at the sweet shop instead. Except all that came out was, oh, he's, he's moved. Huh? said Will, his face scrunched up like a finished bag of crisps. Before I could get my breath back, the school bell began to ring. I glanced behind me again, but no officer in a bright yellow jacket was in sight. Maybe I was safe. Maybe the old man had got confused with so many kids from my school everywhere. He was old, after all. He probably hadn't even recognised me outside the shop. It wasn't until first break that I was finally able to tell Will and Katie everything that had happened. Usually we, we, we would be chasing round kids. And now he's outside the McEwen shop, I finished. He must be sleeping there now. So he's actually living closer to the school said Katie. I nodded. Think so? She shrugged. Still, what's he going to do? You were wearing your mask and hoodie the whole time. He didn't see your face. No one did. And even if they had cameras in the park, the police wouldn't ever be able to recognise it was you. Cameras? I hadn't even thought of that. Katie didn't know that my mask and hood had fallen off, and she didn't know that May Lee had seen me, or the woman with the dog. I didn't want to tell her either. Yeah, that police officer was probably just telling the old man to get lost and move on, said Will. They do that all the time. It's their job, so nothing to worry about. But I couldn't help worrying. I needed to cover my tracks, which meant I had to find May Lee right away and make sure that she didn't say anything. I looked around the playground for her. I couldn't see her anywhere, but I could guess where she was. I'll see you in a bit, I told Will and Katie. I've got to go and um, go and get something. Running down the corridor and up the stairs to our classroom, I stopped outside the door and peeked in through the glass. Sure enough, May Lee was there, just as I thought she would be, with her best friend Rainia and Brainiac Robert and Mrs Vergara. They were arranging a display of books on a shelf, alongside a sign that said, books to inspire you this month and they were chatting and laughing as if it was the most fun way anyone could ever spend a break time. It made me wonder how they could be so clever and so daft all at the same time. Hector, what are you doing here? Spying on your class, are you? I jumped and looked around. It was Mr Lancaster. Uh, no, sir, I just forgot something. And what would that be then, asked Mr Lancaster, standing so close to me that I could see his nose hairs moving. Um, my crisps, I said, just at that moment remembering the letter in my pocket too. For break time, I need to have some every break or I could faint. Faint from lack of crisps, asked Mr Lancaster, frowning. I nodded. Yeah, they're baked, not fried, see sir? So it's like having one of my five a day. Hello, said Mrs Vergara, swinging open the door and smiling at us both. I thought I heard talking. Do I have another helper? I shook my head as fast as I could without it falling off. He came in to get his crisps, said Mr Lancaster. Apparently he could faint if he doesn't have them. Ah, said Mrs Vergara with a sigh. I thought it might have been for something else. She looked at me with her eyebrows raised. Something you might have forgotten to give me this morning? Of course, because Hector's dad has said he was going to get in contact with it, didn't he? I made a silent groan. My dad had obviously told her to expect a letter from me. Wishing Mr Lancaster wasn't standing next to me, I got the crumpled letter out from my pocket and handed it over. There it is, said Mrs Vergara, her eyebrows climbing back down their invisible ladders. How lovely! Then opening it, she began to read it straight away. I watched nervously as Mr Lancaster leaned in and he read it too. But for teachers who expected us to read whole books in just a few days, they seemed to be taking forever. I leaned in to see what was taking them so long. All I had written was, Dear Mrs Vergara, Everyone is always saying we should never lie. But if I said I was sorry for doing that drawing I didn't do, and then in brackets it says the one with smoke and fire coming out of your mouth, then that would be a lie. End of brackets. 
So this is a not sorry letter because I didn't draw that drawing that you want me to be sorry for. And if you want to find out who did it, I think you need to launch a full investigation and maybe call in the FBI too from Hector. But that's certainly what is not what his dad thinks he's written, is it? I see, said Mrs Vergara, frowning as she folded the letter back up. Her lips and face were twitching so much I didn't know if she was happy with the letter or if I was about to get another detention because of it. I looked at Mr Lancaster. His moustache and nose hair were twitching too. Right, well, thank you for this, Mrs Vergara said. I'm glad you told me how you feel and I'll um, see what we can do to investigate the matter further. Now, you better go on in and get your crisps. We wouldn't want you fainting, would we? Holding the door open, she watched as I went inside and slowly walked over to my rucksack. Immediately, like mice who had noticed a cat, Maylie, Robert and Rania stopped what they were doing and watched me too. Actually, Mrs Vergara, I was just on my way to speak to you in private, if I may, said Mr Lancaster. Mrs Vergara nodded, followed Mr Lancaster outside and pulled the door shut behind her. I knew I only had a few seconds, so I took my chance. I walked up to May Lee and, ignoring Robert and Rainier, said, You'd better not tell anyone what you saw yesterday. To my surprise, she stared back at me, not looking even a little bit scared. I took a step closer to her, but she glanced towards the classroom door and, raising an eyebrow, took a deep breath as if she was about to shout for Mrs Vergara. Pardon me. I knew a threat when I saw one. I scowled and took a step back. I'll find you later, I hissed, and if you tell, you'll be in big trouble. I turned to leave when she said loudly, No, you're the one who's going to be in trouble. I spun back round to stare at May Lee. Robert and Rainier were both staring at her too, with their mouths wide open. What did you say? I asked, feeling my face and ears start to heat up. I said, you're the one who's going to be in trouble, said May Lee, taking a step forwards. Not me. What you did to Thomas was horrible. Who's Thomas? I asked, surprised. The man whose trolley you pushed into the lake, said May Lee. You be quiet, I warned May Lee, or else. No, said May Lee, I won't be quiet. I'll tell everyone, we'll tell everyone, she added, pointing to Robert and Rainier, who instantly turned as white as paper, unless, she paused, unless, she said slowly, you apologise to Thomas and replace his trolley. What? I asked, wondering if May Lee had gone completely mad and forgotten who she was talking to. I could tell Robert and Rainier were wondering the same thing. I was about to tell her there was no way I was going to do either of those things when Mrs Vergara opened the door and told me to get back outside if I wasn't planning on helping. I walked towards the door and when I reached it, I turned to give May Lee a warning look. I told her with my eyes that she had better do as I said or else. But she was looking straight back at me as if she wasn't even a bit afraid and giving me a look that said exactly the same thing. Ooh, well, there's a surprise for Hector, isn't it? Um, I mean, I, I don't know, I think he's, he's probably gotten away with the replaced letter that Mrs Vergara and Mr Lancaster have now written. Whether that will be fed back to his father, I don't know, we'll have to wait and see. But he has got a bit of a shock there, hasn't he? Hazel, he was not expecting that from May Lee. In fact, him, Will and Katie, you know, they they are, you know, they're not treating other children very nicely, aren't they? No matter what I've said about Hector, I'm not convinced that, you know, his heart is in all this. I'm really not. I think he's trying to prove something to other children. But when all said and done, he was not expecting that. And I wonder how May Lee knows that the old man's name is Thomas. She must have spoken to him at, at some point. That's the only way I can imagine that she knows his name. So, Hector 
threatened her, didn't he? You better not say anything or else. And she has given that straight back to him. Well, actually, no, you're going to be the one in trouble. And she's put this challenge out, hasn't it? She'll she'll say nothing if he does the right thing and apologises to Thomas and replaces the trolley. Although how you go about replacing the trolley, I really don't know. So that's the end of chapter six. So have a lovely evening, Hazel, and I will catch up with you again, What, which will be the end of the week already. It flies by, I think. So I will see you again tomorrow. Bye for now. Bye.